Hey, and welcome to uh, kind of a combination of talking, visual talk MFT, uh, and uh, kind of continuation of uh, talking financially, and pretty much a combination all the above regards to what I do. Um, so I'm going to be doing a little bit of politics as well as financials. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, I did put up a new um, new uh, MFT basics on uh, calvintaylor.substack.com. Uh, I also uh, put up a new uh, um, episode of Talking Financially on anchor.fm slash Talking Financially. Check those out and uh, let me know what you think. Anyway, uh, I keep hearing a lot of these, a lot of things about reverse repos uh, in regards to the financial system. And, and also, uh, and uh, kind of, I would kind of want to like try to answer at least one or two questions that I have. And I don't, I don't know if you have it or not, but um, if you do, I'm hoping this will help you uh, with the answer. Now, I've heard a lot of that, as I said, reverse, uh, reverse uh, repos, reverse re uh, repurchasing agreements, basically what, what they are. A reverse repo basically is a is called a reverse repo, which begin which brings into the implementation of an agreement between buyer and a seller, stating that that the buyers of the securities who purchase any kind of securities or assets have the right to sell them at a higher price in the future, i.e., the seller who has to accept the higher price in the future. The explanation of the repo and a repo uh, repur reverse repo re repurchase agreement. There are generally two parties involved, obviously. One leg of the execution uh, primarily comprises of a commercial bank re uh, purchasing securities security from a central bank. The other leg of the uh, execu uh, ex executed transaction comprises the sale of an exact security or asset purchase earlier from the commercial bank again to the central bank. These transactions, which generally involve buying and selling securities, can also be seen from the viewpoint of a collateral-based loan. This agreement is, moreover, an overnight loan with the terms of con and conditions extending to a period to a maximum of 14 days. Interesting. 14 days, that's how long right now you have to be quarantined. Anyway, I've seen that number a couple of times here. Anyway, the Federal Reserve implements a reverse repurchase uh, agreements with agreements uh, pledging up to 65 business days. So, yes, the, uh, as you can see, there's a, um, uh, a thing here that says commercial bank, the central bank. Then, uh, oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> purchasing purchase security to the bank. And the, the central bank repurchases it with securities. Uh, yeah, so that's basically what the bank has been doing. They, they've been selling, uh, or sorry, they've been buying and selling, buying and selling, buying and selling. And that means they do a lot of transactions in that way. I believe it's $120 billion worth of that. Anyway, so that's the components of a reverse repurchase agreement. A reverse repurchase agreement or reverse repo primarily consists of two parties. That I, I, I've already gone through this. How does uh, re reverse repo work? The primary users of such an agreement are generally monetary authorities, financial institutions, uh, mutual fund companies, sovereign funds, commercial banks, and pension funds. Oh, wait. Uh, let's continue. Uh, commercial banks, pension funds insurance companies, etc. The reverse repo rate is primarily used by monetary bodies to obtain money from the banking system and to squeeze or prohibit increased liquid liquidity in a market to keep a check on the supply of money in the economy. So when people like Joe Manchin sit there and say that the Fed is pumping money into the, uh, into the economy, He's only telling half half the truth. They are, but they're, they're taking it out. Uh, this short-term lending is provided to investors who may be highly cash uh, but are prone to take risk. Yeah, you have big banks who, who did that in the, in the 2008, you know, stuff of that nature. Anyway, so let's see, to investors who may be highly cash uh, 
but are prone to take risks. This may be this may yeah this may be utilized to to procure short positions in the market, which was previously covered by the other party. The securities are sold by the seller to the buyer with a commitment that repurchase agreements for the time being reduces the number of reserve balances in the money in the banking system. For example, the reverse repo rate is the rate of interest that is offered by the federal bank to other operating banks that deposit that deposit or invest their cash reserve or securities into the treasury of the federal bank. This is cons considered to be a better, uh, much better and safer parking avenue than lending the same to companies, uh, same to companies or customers as a, as in reverse repo. The securities or funds are safe with the federal bank. To cite an example, every federal bank will have a fixed percentage of repos, a uh, reverse repo rate, which is offered, which offers to the other parties involved in these agreements, uh, which I think is a third party thing that, that they had just um, did uh, with the uh, uh, on the Red Report, which I read off uh, some some time ago, my my talk at Financially on Anchor. Anyways, suppose we assume the repo rate fixed by a federal bank in the U.S. is 6%, which means if a commercial bank has an excess cash surplus of 500000 available with it, the bank can invest the same in a, re a reverse repo agreement with the federal bank. Doing this, uh, the particular commercial bank will earn an interest of 30000 which is also called the haircut margin. Benefits of a reverse mortgage, uh, oh, sorry, reverse mortgage, Reverse repo, excuse me, below our, okay, and uh, it encourages other banks to store their excess cash with the federal bank during high levels of inflation in the economy, like right now, so that the banks can earn more returns on the on their excess funds. Yeah, but the federal, the, the, the Fed, uh, their interest portion is down to 0 0.05 or 0, 0 0.025. Which is better for the overall economy, but not very good as far as the banks, which is fine by me, but um, that just means I have to do a lot of uh, repos in order to get that fixed back into the in, back into the banks themselves. Anyway, so let's see, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'll worry about that. It is a way of uh, profit earning and the method of the margin earned due to selling of a particular security or cash reserve at a higher rate to the original seller. In cases of a bank, the profit earned uh, the profit earned is in the process of interest earned due to parking of excess cash with the federal or central bank. The reverse repo rate is an instrument method of controlling the money supply available in the economy. A high rate helps in injecting uh, liquid liquidity into the economy. It stimulates commercial banks to invest or store excess funds with the federal bank to earn a higher return. Risk. Uh, federal banks had to have to confront costs with reverse repo agreements, which are not similar to the costs facing other federal counterparties. So these cause difference uh, between account for somewhere, accounted for somewhere. A reverse repo on a large scale can lead to major banking uh, disintermediation. Okay. Uh, the reverse. Repurchasing repurchase agreements with an entity's counterparty typically has no proper establishment. The final health of the the financial health of the two parties involved and the value of the collateral is not judicially uh, measured or checked. The counterparty has a chance to default on on its said obligation. The collateral given is prone to lose value due to volatility in the market and changes in the market scenario. Conclusion, the reverse purchase agreement is a substitute method to provide liquidity to a portfolio. It is a method to prevent liquidation of portfolio to face the overseen un unforeseen requirement of cash. It is also used as an effective cash management practice. The reverse repo is a collateral dem uh, deposit for the lender of funds provisioning, provisioning itself with a short-term investment or scope and in, uh, in this way also creates a gateway of borrowing of the security to get a certain portion or a certain short position covered. It is generally targeted, and it sounds to me like the Fed is trying to make sure that 
those investors who have made the killing, pretty much in some cases, literally a killing, uh, in short selling, uh, this is to make sure that the economy is not, it does not go down with that short selling. Um, I saw a, what was it? I saw an article about George Soros in England uh, from the 90s where he short sold the pound that almost bankrupt uh, England. Um, I can't remember the exact reason other than the fact that he, uh, since, um, since the, I think it was George Soros, uh, he, he basically, he bet against the, uh, the, Eng the English economy. This was be I believe this was before they entered uh, into uh, the uh, European Union. Uh, they were part of another uh, financial system. Um, I can't remember what it was right now, but I mean, you can look it up as far as George Soros and uh, who was it? And some other um, investors in regards to that. Anyway, so let's see. We're, 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 okay, blah, 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 cover it is generally targeted to control the supply of money in the economy as a whole. They are also considered safer because it primarily involves treasury securities. Okay, so now that you know what the hell I'm talking about there, let's see if I can get that on that one. Don't need that. Let's see. Uh, so yeah, this is the reason why they've been selling more and more, or selling and buying, selling and buying, selling and buying uh, more. They're trying, they're trying to taper, they're, they're trying to taper what's what's actually in the economy right now. So they get, so they put in a little bit, take it a lot more. Put in a little bit, take a lot, take out a lot more. Put in a little bit, take out a lot more. That's to make sure that when they do need money for loans and stuff of that nature, they can provide it. And also, they just started putting in, uh, like a re a re I think, a regular regular financial testing, like every six months or so, uh, something like that. In the very beginning of this, I remember reading off a red report that the banks, uh, that the Fed was was requiring that uh, big, big, bigger banks and smaller banks uh, add the reserves they are given uh, through as, uh, asset purchasing. Uh, they set aside, like, say, I, I want to say it was 30%. I could be wrong about that, but I think it was 30% of the reserves uh, for, you know, to make sure that they have the, as you, as you, as I just told you, the overnight rate for the, for the uh, repo, uh, the, the reverse repos uh, that, they, that they would be doing. Anyway, so let's see. They've been, they've been doing, doing a lot of that in regards to that part. But again, th that is to make sure that there is no excess reserves in the economy to facilitate more inflation in regards to the interest rates on loans and stuff of that nature. When they have the interest rate as a whole down to the 0 0.025, that's to help balance out the price, uh, the price margin in the overall economy, which to a certain degree has actually been working in certain areas uh, of the country. Uh, certain states are just just high uh, high in uh, taxes and stuff of that nature so uh, it's a combination of taxes we need to go down in regards to middle, to middle, uh, to middle income americans and stay about where they are already for corporations um until those individual economies get back up and running anyway that's my point on that uh <laughs> let's see uh yeah, as you can see, uh, they they they've gone up slightly as far as the overnight re uh, reverse repurchasing agreements. As you can see in uh, in 2021, uh, this month, actually a couple of days ago, uh, they were about equal. And according to for they've done a little bit more uh, regards to uh, on the right hand side of the screen as you see it. I did want to, there's still one thing I wanted to look up if I can find it. Uh, okay, let's say nope. Uh, no, nope, not that. Um, I saw, I believe I saw it. Let me see. No, no, no. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
Okay, we also have, uh, apparently, according to the Federal Times, Pelosi increases caps on pay for the House staff. First of all, it's about damn time. Second of all, why hadn't that happened before? And third, why did it take her to do it? It should have been done by anybody who was the Speaker of the House. Anyway, so employees working for members or committees of the House of Representatives will have the opportunity to reach higher levels of compensation with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announcing uh, today that the maximum annual rate for pay for House staff will be set at 199 point or 199 300 uh, each year, apparently. This order will help the Congress recruit and retain the outstanding and uh, outstanding and diverse talent that we need. So in other words, because of inflation, they had to they had to increase their uh, spending as well as part of the employees, which is good. Um, to recruit and retain the outstanding diverse talent they, that we need, as it also helps ensure parity between employees of the House of Representatives and other employees of the federal government, the California Democrat wrote in a letter to the members. The new cap for House for House staff would put earning potential in line with the members of the Senior Executive Service, as well as senior level scientific and professional part positions. The general schedule is capped at 172 500 and the executive schedule is capped at 221400 Some fun, some few uh, some few feds do make more than uh, those caps due to special hiring and pay provisions. According to the Congressional Research Service, the pay maximum maximums of house employees uh, and have, have increased over the past 20 years but now but sorry, but not kept pace with inflation. Like everything, nothing's kept up. Kept up with inflation. The 140, uh, okay, the 140 451 pay cap of 2001 is equal to about 204 258 in 2020 terms. Meanwhile, pay in 2020 was capped at 173 900. The Average pay for many house staff positions also decreased when compared against inflation. Based on 2020 dollars, office managers have executive assistants, or I'm sorry, and executive assistants made 24.4 and 21.1 percentage less, respectively, than they did in 2001. Only legislative correspondents, caseworkers, and chiefs of staff have seen relative increase in their pay and none exceeding a 4%. Exact numbers of average pay per uh, pay varied significantly based on position, but staff assistants, legislative correspondents, field representatives, and constituent service representatives all made at or below 50,000 on average in 2019. Many members of the congressional staff also work in Washington, a DC, and uh, a notoriously expensive city in which to live. Okay, and many staffers often quickly leave due to punishing schedule, comparatively low pay, high stakes, and or public division. In fact, according to 2019 House Com Compensation and Diversity Study report, staff in member uh, staff in member offices have been in a position for 2.5 years on average, while staff in a committee and leadership office average 2.7 years in position, Bradford Fitch, president and CEO of the Congressional, uh, the CF, CMF, said on May 6th, be hearing before the House Select Committee on Modernization of Congress. A legislative uh, assistant in the House with three years of experience or more could easily increase their pay by 25 to 50 percent if they move to a trade association or a lobby shop. A, se a Senate chief of staff can triple their salary in a few years after leaving Capitol, Fitch said. Pelosi cited the work of that select committee in her decision to increase staff pay caps, noting that it constituted part of Congress. Uh, wait, that it constituted part of Congress' effort to make the House a more inclusive, open, and representative of the full range of voices and value of their of our community. Again, they should have done that a long time ago. But anyway, let's see. 
I was going to try to see about the average home in Ohio. Uh, okay. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. I'm not part of my little part here. Let's see. Uh, b -b 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 okay. Let's go with this one. This is basically just like kind of like off the off the rails kind of news, I suppose. Student loans, bankruptcy, uh, bipartisan bankruptcy reform bill pr proposes alternative to forgiveness, hope, or lifelong debt. Let me get off this part. Uh, while some progressive Democrats continue to push the president to cancel student loan debt, there's a bipartisan effort. Oops. There's a bipartisan uh, effort underway to overhaul the student loan system in another way, by making bankruptcy discharge more accessible for student debtors. Here's the problem. He was one of them that voted against that in the 90s. Uh, also, uh, the Fed, uh, the Red, Red Report that I reported a couple of days ago, uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's a different thing. Uh, no, that's right. Actually, I'm, I'm mistaken. My, my fiance sent me something um, saying that uh, starting on, well, uh, actually August 8th and until I'm not even sure when, um, the education department will be getting together and trying to redo the rules and regulations of like forgiveness of student loans and stuff of that nature. So we'll have to see what happens there. But anyway, there, let's see. Overall, okay, so student debtors, um, Senate Majority Whip and Dick Durbin, who chaired the Senate Judiciary Committee, and Senator John Cornyn announced a new bill called the Fresh Start Through uh, Bankruptcy Act of 2021 last week to better enable borrowers to seek a student loan discharge and bankruptcy. Problem with that is bankruptcy stays on your record either way. So, um, so they're going to allow you to go through bankruptcy, which I think actually a lot of people from that era did already and their credits are still messed up. So this, I think this is going to probably just make it worse. Student loan debt follows you to your grave. So does, so does bankruptcy. Um, our as far as I know about anyways, I've never gone, so I don't know. Uh, our, big, our bipartisan bill finally gives student borrowers, some who, are, who were misled into taking out costly loans by predatory profit uh, for-profit colleges, which a lot of these people actually donate to you or get donations from a uh, chance to get back on their feet when they are no longer a realistic path to repay that lo their loans. If passed, the bill would allow federal student loans to become eligible for discharge of bankruptcy proceedings 10 years after the borrower's first loan payment comes due. I thought, I thought that was already a bill. Okay, anyway. Um, or already passed, excuse me. Uh, borrowers who, uh, with loans less than 10 years old, well, would have to go through the current process. What's the freaking point then? Uh, Jason Luliano, uh, associate professor of law at the University of Utah and an expert on student loan bankruptcy law, told uh, Yahoo Finance that the bill's 10 year waiting period was noteworthy. Right. How much, did, how much did he get paid to, to, for his law assistance on this? First, uh, I'm guessing it was a he, right? Uh, but, but yeah, I'm guessing he. Anyway, uh, first, it would ensure that people who have struggled to repay their student loans for at least a decade can benefit from the bankruptcy's fresh start and get their lives back on track. That depends. The Luniano said, and second, it would ensure that the student loan credit Market continues to function. Bill also, okay, credit loan market. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be a credit loan market in the first fucking place. Anyway, uh, the bill also proposes to increase institutional accountability by making colleges that receive federal loans from more than a third of their student uh, partially reimburse the Department of Education if student loans are later discharged in bankruptcy or if the colleges have consistently high default rates and low repayment rates. This is an excellent proposal that would help align, uh, align schools incentives with their students incentives, Luliano exp uh, explained. Instead of engaging in an over increased, uh, ever increased, excuse me, ever increasing student arm, uh, tuition arms, 
race, uh, underperforming schools would be forced to cut tuition or improve employment prospects for their students. Roughly 45 million Americans hold more than 1.7 trillion in federally backed uh, student loan debt. That's the only loan that people actually owe in regards to uh, um, uh, personally owned debt, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, let's see. Discharging student loans through bankruptcy will, will uh, while difficult, is not impossible. The, that said, there are there was an era where it was much easier to process. Before 76, student loans were treated like other types of unsecured debt bankruptcies. If you were facing financial ruin, you could get relief, Durbin explained, but then Congress got the idea that student borrowers were running to bankruptcy court right after graduation. This notion was based on more anecdotal than data. Congress started passing laws to make it harder. Over time, the bankruptcy code became more restrictive for all student debtors. In most personal bankruptcy cases involving student debt, a judge now applies the Bruner test, a three-pronged test applied to students loan, student loan borrowers who file adversary proceedings at least seeking to a discharge of educational debt to determine if the specific student loans caused a borrower to suffer undue hardship. It's a loan. They all cause undue hardship. Anyway. Let's see. Mm, no. Okay. Now, I hear a lot of politicians saying that for universal uh, basic uh, universal basic uh, income. Uh, let's just see what the different kinds are, uh, because I know Stephanie Kelton has her thoughts on um, oh, who is it? Uh, Andrew Yang's UBI. Last I checked, uh, his version of UBI was either you get the one, one lump sum uh, per month, which at that time I think was a thousand bucks. Uh, in comparison to a certain amount for each kid or uh, how much rent was and all that stuff. So and, and initially, I think um, the UBI in his case wouldn't have made, wouldn't have made a, a dent in anybody's um, life as far as that part goes. But let's see. Uh, Universal Basic Income by, by Kimberly Amadio, or however you say it, uh, and Thomas J. Brock. Uh, as you can see, a universal basic income is a government guaranteed payment that each citizen receives. It is also called a citizen's income guaranteed minimum income or a basic income. The intention behind the payment is to provide enough to cover the basic cost of living and establish a sense of financial security for everyone. The concept is also seen as a way to offset job losses caused by technology. Learn more about, okay, yeah. Uh, definition and examples of universal basic income. Let's see. Universal basic income is a program where every citizen receives a flat, mo a flat monthly payment, regardless of whether they, uh, they're working or earning an income. Different programs outline who's exactly receiving the, received the income. Some states that all citizens would get, it regardless of what they make, while other programs may only give it to those who who fall below the poverty line that makes more sense one per one proposal would play would play would pay just those left jo uh, left jobless due to robotics uh, a plan that 48 percent of americans supported uh, alternate names for it was uh, citizens income guarantee minimum income or basic income acronym as ubi Let's see how it works. Proponents of universal basic income vary widely in their views of how to fund and execute the program. Some plans call for a tax increase on the wealthy, while others say corporations should be taxed. Okay. Uh, increase on the wealthy, while others say corporations should be taxed. Are they, are they the same people? Um, economic, uh, economist Milton Friedman proposed a negative income tax. Uh, the poor would receive a tax credit if they if their income fell below a minimum level. Okay, how can you have a income tax if your if your income is negative? Maybe I read that in more literal sense. But anyway, uh, income uh, fell below a minimum level. It would be equivalent to the uh, tax payment for the family uh, families earning above the minimum uh, minimum 
um, level. No. Uh, in 2018, uh, Facebook co-founder Chris Hughes outlined his plan in his book, Fair Shot, about something else. Um, he argued that U.S. workers, uh, students, and caregivers make, uh, making 50000 or less a year should receive a guaranteed income of $500 a month. Cash is the best thing you can do to um, to uh, improve health uh, health outcomes, education outcomes, and lift people out of poverty. He was said, has said in uh, interviews. His guaranteed income plan is financed by taxes on the top one percent. It would work through a modernization of the earned income tax credit. Um, Sir Richard Bronson said, "Guaranteed income is." Becoming uh, automotive automation has fundamentally changed the structure of the U.S. economy. Similarly, Elon Musk has said robotics will take away most people's jobs, so universal income is the only solution. Uh, pros and cons, as you can see, now workers could wait for better jobs or better wages, or could trigger inflation. No, um, it's, no. You can't trigger inflation with uh, income if there's if there's enough if there's enough uh, demand to chase with it, um, or I mean enough product to chase with it. Um, let's see, freedom for people to return to school or stay home to to care for relatives, no increased standard of living in the long run. Mm, nah, I don't know. That's false on that one. Uh, okay, so reduced program wouldn't make a real difference. Uh, would make a huge difference in a lot of people's lives, anyways. Uh, may help remove the poverty trap from uh, traditional welfare programs. Free income may not incentivize people to get, to get jobs. That's full. Um, simple, straightforward financial assistance that minimize um, could perpetrate falling labor force participation rights. That's happening now. Uh, and it's mainly because of more of, the, more of the supply chain and not the demand. Plenty of demand, not of supply. And that is both labor, transportation, and other aspects of it. Well, of course, two different things, but still. <laughs> it would go, go with the same line. Lower administrative costs and with traditional welfare. Many oppose giving money to the unemployed. Many of those who have lots and lots of money. Uh, see. More money for young families and economic stability during recession. There's actually at least two more positive than there are negatives as far as the barcodes as you saw. Uh, pros explained uh, workers could wait for a better situation uh, and unconstitutional, uh, unconst yeah, unconditional, excuse me, not unconstitutional, uh, an unconditional basic income would enable workers to wait for a better job or negotiate better wages. Uh, you yeah, better wages part. That's unless you're a private union, that's not going to happen. Uh, unless you're a very small business, um, freedom for people to return to school or stay home to care for a relative. Yeah, uh, workers could improve their marketability by going back to school. They would feel less pressure to keep a job if they needed to take time to care for a relative. Uh, may help remove the poverty trap from traditionally or uh, traditional uh, welfare programs. Many existing welfare programs are criticized for keeping people below the poverty line. Oftentimes, if welfare recipients make too much money, they lose the food stamps, free medical care, and housing vouchers. That was the problem right there. Uh, even if their income is still unequal to a cost of living, a basic income could serve as a supportive springboard rather than a chain into the welfare system. Yeah, that was a problem that Andrew Yang had back in the day when he first brought this to uh, to main to the main light as far as mainstream. He said you got to have this or this, not this and this. So that was the problem, and that's part of the reason why uh, the idea got some traction, but he kind of stagnated. Anyway, let's see. Uh, simple, straightforward financial assistance for or that minimize bureaucracy. Current welfare programs are also complicated for administrators and recipients. A universal income would replace housing vouchers, food stamps, and other programs. Lower administrative costs than with traditional welfare, the, the simplicity 
of the program means it would also uh, cost governments less. Cash payments that went to that went to everyone would eliminate cost, income, and ver uh, verification pa paperwork. Pa -pa -work. There we go. Uh, more money for young families. Some countries are concerned about falling birth rates. Uh, guaranteed income would give young couples the confidence they need to start a family. Why would you? Why would you on the, on this planet right now? But anyway, uh, personal opinion in there. Sorry. Uh, economic stability during recessions from a macro um, economic point of view or a viewpoint, it would give a society a much needed uh, ba ballast uh, during a recession. Uh, let's see, the cons or from con artists anyway, could trigger inflation. If everyone suddenly received a basic income, it could create inflation. Most would immediately seek to spend the extra cash driving up demand and eventually raising prices. Well, you raise prices, you also, wages, you also uh, raise wages in that case, which kind of balances out the inflation part of it because inflation basically means that too few uh, current and too, mu too less currency changes too much um, uh, uh, products or the other way around actually. Too much, okay, anyway. <laughs> Got myself all kinds of fucked up there, anyway. But that's not right either way. Triggering inflation, no. You more money on, unless there's too few goods and too much a demand running after it. That's the only way inflation happens. Otherwise, as long as there's a balancing gap between inflation or between the supply and the demand portion of things, everything's fine as far as the part goes. No increase increase the standard of living in the long run. Um, high pri higher prices would soon make the basic of unaffordable uh, unaffordable to those at the bottom of the income. Pay uh, again, if you got both, this would th th this one go because you already have the cost of living going up without this. It's it's a it's it's the same basic premise. If cost of living going up, the person who gets the extra in the and the money supply in order to be able to afford the cost of living increase will still be able to increase their livelihood. Uh, reduced program wouldn't make a real difference. Uh, a guaranteed income that's enough to eliminate poverty would be too expensive. That makes uh, it more expensive to keep them on the, pro on the program. A guaranteed income that's enough to eliminate poverty would be too expensive. That makes a truly uh, effective program a difficult investment. No, no. Uh, reduced program wouldn't make a real difference. Actually, would make a hell of a lot of difference in a hell of a lot of lives. That would create more people being able to afford a lot more, create more demand within different sectors of the community. Free income may not uh, incentivize people to get jobs. That is total bullshit. Um, if you uh, because that that it, it's not like each time uh, prices of price of uh, the cost of living go up, that goes up. That stays, as far as I know about, at that level, incentivizing you to get off of that. And or maybe uh, if it doesn't matter how much you get, uh, in certain, and it's depending on the tax bracket, if you still if you get that and the cost of living goes up, that would actually incentivize you to keep going with jobs and all that other stuff. So. Either way, it's a lump sum, so it doesn't go up as uh, the cost of living goes up. So it's true that they freaking do that. That's why that, that's that, that's why right now uh, I myself will begin to bump the social security because inflation of gas prices. Uh, if we had a uh, inflation of, of a of, uh, cost of living in general, I would I, I wouldn't be at thirteen hundred. I'd be like at fifteen or sixteen hundred right now. But we didn't have that because gas prices were actually very low for the past, what, three or four years. Anyway, could perpetrate falling labor, uh, falling labor force participation rates. The cycle could prevent some from ever, uh, ever getting a good job in a competitive environment, thus reducing an already falling labor force participation rate. No, because if that that's the if that's the case, then some then the people who get the basic income has the money to survive the already falling labor force. 
uh, many opposed giving money to unemployment uh, unemployed. This is uh, this no string attached income is difficult for some people to support. They fear that if incentivizing people to stay unemployed and live uh, only off of welfare, that's not going to happen either. None of that stuff's going to happen. Um, anyway, I'm taking this way too personally. I shouldn't be, but I am. Anyway, so let's see. Now you know what that what, what that's about. If you didn't know before, I mean, let's see. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, Biden asks OPEC, OPEC, OPEC to pump more oil. Is that climate denial? Let's see. If you like what uh what you see, um, and you have the opportunity to subscribe, please do so. If you have uh, the opportunity to donate please do so if you like it and want to share please do so either way please do so <laughs> anyway so on wednesday the white house asked the organization of the petroleum export countries or opec to pump more oil in hopes of stemming the rise in gas prices in the united states now again wouldn't this just like invite more of the uh, the uh, renewable energy bills to go through faster if oil and all that kept going up. I don't know, maybe not. Anyway, President Joe Biden administration requests to increase production of a major source of planet heating pollution uh, came just days after the United Nations issued a dire report on climate change, which begs the question, is this president denying the reality of global emissions crisis? No, he's hoping that his approval rating will go up. Uh, Biden's seven-month tenure ab uh, abounds with climate contradictions or, I mean, I'm sorry, on the on one hand, the Democrats, uh, Democrat has blocked a major pipeline project reviving U.S. carbon dip diplomacy and requested unprecedented levels of climate spending from Congress. On the other hand, he's changed, he's charged ahead with other pipelines approved more than 2,000 permits to drill for oil and gas on public lands and cut a coal company's royal, uh, royalty payments and asked Congress for, for a, uh, significantly less money than experts say is needed to rapidly cut emissions in short. Uh, he's doing more than ever before on climate and still very far from enough. Uh, while asking OPEC for more oil may look like a softer version of climate change denial than the last four years of the U.S. leadership, what it really demonstrates is two far, two far more uh, pernicious forces preventing policymakers from taking rational steps to avoid disaster, inertia, and inequality. In a country where a, sur a surprise $500 expense would thrust 50% of adults into debt, major fluctuations in commodities like gas prices pinch the most vulnerable purse. The national average for gas prices has climbed over the past year, crossing the $3 per gallon mark in May for the first time since 2014. The price for regular uh, blend of fuel hit uh, 3.185 this week, up from 3.144 a month ago, according to the AAA. The, those cents add up for a vast majority of Americans who rely on gas-powered automobiles to get around. The price flux can also affect the cost of various household goods, which become more expensive to ship as fuel prices increase. They also make it difficult for the average person to think about the long-term potential advantages of short-term suffering like paying more for gas to avoid disastrous climate effects in the future, especially when the policy causing the pain isn't even designed to specifically to deliver those benefits. In an ec economy where the price of basic needs like health care and housing is subject to investor speculation, it's easier for, more, for most people to see a choice between real immediate expenses and moderate and modest potential climate benefits. In the long, oops, in the long term, uh, and decide that on the letter it, it's better to roll the dice. Yeah, oh, okay. Uh, 
In an email sent after this article was initially published, the White House official said the administration needs to do two things at once, achieve our climate goals while ensuing the energy transition is one that takes into account the interests of the middle class or experience changes in energy prices very directly uh, and meet global energy needs as the economy recovers from the pandemic. Inflation prices, which are starting to level off in some sectors of the economy but remain worse in energy, pose a political threat to the president as his party tries to use its razor-thin majority in Congress to fund new investments in electric vehicles and clean energy mandate zero uh, carbon electricity and inject billions into a scientific research and will and while allowing prices to remain high may force some in the u.s to lower their emissions by driving and consuming less that burden will fall on the poorest people who over the course of their lives are responsible for the far less greenhouse gas pollution than the wealthy who can simply pay more without changing their behavior. It's the definition of regressive tax, except that it wouldn't even deliver the benefits of actual tax. France tried that in 2018 and imposed a new tax on diesel, aiming to raise money for a transition away from fossil fuels and incentivize French drivers to use less and opt for cleaner transportation. In response, the Yellow Vest protest movement named for the safety garb Drivers keep in their vehicles to wear if, they're, if they face trouble on the road erupted within weeks and the, with polls, uh, with polls, the polls showing more than two thirds of the country supporting the protesters. The French government backtracked. Okay, this is a long one. Is that it? Okay. Uh, buh, 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 okay. The incident demonstrated the del delicacy and with which governments and democracies must impl implement policies to curb emissions and the attention that must be paid to whose who's yeah, who's lives face the greatest disruption in the short term from efforts to scale back or scale down fossil fuels. It also sparked the then uh, nascent movement for a Green New Deal, a climate policy framework that prioritizes social safety nets, and government-led industrial planning over pricing mechanisms that impose the cost on polluters. Sarah Hunt, CEO of the, uh, the Joseph Rainey Center for Public Policy, said in a series of tweets that Biden's request of OPEC highlights how we are not going to choose a habitat planet tomorrow over quality of life today. People want cheap energy more than they want the clean energy. People don't want cheap energy produced in their backyard, she wrote. The only answer, she added, is to innovate better energy with fewer alternatives. Oh, sorry, extern uh, externalities. Wrong word. Anyway, Biden's uh, ask of OPEC uh, unsurprisingly drew fire from conservatives who argued the administration is destroying energy jobs at home and making the nation more reliant on fossil fuels produced overseas than progressive climate advocates who questioned the, his commitment to rapidly con confronting greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Lauren Stockman, a senior research analyst, uh, analyst at Climate Adv uh, Advocacy Group, Oil Change International, said the move this week showed why the Biden administration should take should be taking a very uh, every possible step to reduce demand for oil and increase production of uh, zero carbon in, uh, alternatives. Energy dependency and energy dominance uh, were myths spun by American petroleum institutions and his lackeys and Washington Stockman told uh, uh, Huff Post an email. The United States will only uh, ever be free from manipulation of the international oil market when it ends fossil fuel subsidies, supports uh, a just transition to clean energy and ends the per pernicious uh, influence of oil lobby. Now well, the long one to read. Let's see. And this one I was going to do something uh, another time. Anyway, so let's see. Let me start to stop sharing this. There we go. Well, I'd like to thank you for um, for attending this. Uh, I'm going to try to do more of these, and this will be going up on hopefully my BitTube on my 
Calvin Taylor dot uh, uh, Substack and my YouTube channel, as I think I already said, actually. Um, as I said, if you have a chance to subscribe, please do. If you have a chance to donate, please do. If you have a chance to share, please do. If you have a comment, please do. Uh, thank you again for uh, listening and watching, and uh, peace out for now.